There we go. So in reinforcement learning, the whole idea is um, not to actually do the supervision, but to give some type of incentive, right? Uh, a reward value that's helping people, helping the algorithm understand what is an acceptable behavior or not, right? So we, we give it some reward or some penalty, but we don't tell it the actual answer of, um, uh, of what to do, right? Because here we're thinking about a, a behavioral algorithm, right? A, a, an agent that might be embodied and we have some uh, scenario, a particular instance in time or uh, things of this sort, an event, and the agent has to uh, pick from a number of different actions what to do. So you can still think of this as sort of like a classification, supervised classification, where we have um, some um, representation of the state of the world as our X, and then our Y would be what is the correct action to give. But uh, many times we cannot say exactly what to do. Like say, when you're trying to learn how to bicycle, your parent or your friend doesn't tell you, you know, then push here, push with this amount of force, et cetera, right? So you can just uh, give general guidance. You should be trying to keep balance. You should look straight ahead, et cetera. And uh, these um, statements are then internalized by us and transformed into some type of utility function, or in our case, uh, a return function. Okay, so there are lots of different characteristics of reinforcement learning, uh, like we've already said, there's a reward, uh, not a particular supervisor who says, what's the right answer. Usually, uh, again, the feedback is not going to be uh, right away, okay, it's going to take some time for it to come up, uh, because we don't, uh, ha we have to make actions at every decision point, but uh, we don't always get feedback. Uh, you can think of this even in, uh, in the case of games, right, where you might be moving around in a world, not accumulating any uh, particular score, okay? Um, time does matter because uh, we have a, a basically a sequence of different uh, states of the environment or uh, uh, instance uh, problem that we're trying to understand. And you know, the, the outcome of a previous decision affects the subsequent ones. Okay, so with that, what we want to do is to think about um, uh, a reward function, right? So the whole point is like, if we were trying to learn how to do behavior, can we um, simplify it uh, and abstract away from the, the central premise and think of this as a single type of uh, problem where we're just given input and uh, occasionally we get uh, a non-zero reward, okay, some uh, uh, thing, okay. We are actually going to simplify it down to just a scalar value, some integer or a real value, okay. We, we can say even if you want to give structured feedback, let's say, uh, again, look ahead or uh, pedal uh, constantly, etc. when you're going on the bicycle, we are going to transfer all of that types of statements and then assign um, a score, right? A score for each of those uh, rubrics and then put it into a single scalar value, right? A reward function, okay? And then uh, with that, we can uh, get an idea about how to uh, engineer, again, some type of loss function, a utility function that's going to drive our learner to exhibit the correct behavior, okay? So what we want to do is, again, solve the reinforcement learning problem or solve the planning problem and uh, not think about it as a, a single instance, but as a series of instances, right? So here's the, the crux of the problem is that we have an X that we are getting, okay? That's our observation at a, a certain time point, okay? And at that time point, the agent is then going to say, okay, I have observed this X, this OT, at time t. And then I want to execute a uh, particular action. Let's call that our y, again, in, in the same terminology as supervised learning, right? And then uh, we're going to receive a reward for doing that action. It could be a negative value, it could be a positive value, or like I said, sometimes we don't get any signal at all. It could be zero. And then uh, we're going to receive that, but we're actually going to get it at the next timestamp. So this information is going to be reacted at the next timestamp. Okay, meaning that we take this observation, the environment then receives the action, um, generates two pieces of information, uh, of the observation for the next state, like where you are now, okay, after pressing on the pedal, you've moved ahead one meter or so, and has uh, given you re some reward, like you haven't fallen down, so you get some positive reward. 
Okay, and and so this is going to be the the, the general framework that we are trying to go through. Okay, and this is a recursive, uh, uh, sorry, an iterative process, right, where we are going through all the observations, uh, all of the time steps until we finish uh, a version of the problem, either the agent dies or uh, reaches its goal or a uh, number of goals, right? So you could have the agent have a number of goals with different uh, final rewards. When we get to the end of um, the problem, you know, when we get to a reward or the agent terminates, we call that the end of a uh, episode, right? So it's a one particular execution. And then we can reset, okay? If, the, uh, if we're allowed to, you know, in some cases, if you have a simulated environment, and you can plan, you can execute the environment many times. In certain cases, let's say uh, actually a robot agent falling off a cliff, well, then it's gone, right? There's nothing we can do. Okay, so what we're going to do is say that we have a history, right? We're going to model it as a sequence of observations, a sequence of actions, and uh, the sequence of action generates a reward that's coupled with the observation at the next time step, right? So uh, we can say that the history is the sequence of observations, but more importantly for us is the abstraction, okay? The abstraction of a state, right? So state is basically some way of encoding all of the information that we need about either the environment or about the agent or about the information that's happening um, in both the uh, agent and the environment, okay? So we, we're abstracting away from the actual physical environment um, and then trying to represent that in some knowledge representation form, okay? Some, uh, again, a vector of values that somehow denotes information about what we want to do or where we are in the world. Okay, so uh, you can differentiate these two pieces of information, right? So uh, there's environment state, which we have on the left side, right? Basically saying, okay, uh, I'm using GPS or some grid-like world to indicate where I am in the space. And in the notebook you uh, have or will be doing um, this type of exercise where you have a grid world, you know, frozen lake or whatever, okay? Or, um, you know, an X and a Y coordinate, or I think in, in the uh, balancing cart, you only have an X, right? So you have an environment that you have some information about and an agent state right the internal representation of whatever that agent thinks about itself okay um, so one thing that we might want to encode is the history right so even though we've taken multiple time time steps we're going to make this assumption later on uh, about um, all the information being needed to represent what to do next is encoded exactly only in the last state okay so with that uh, type of assumption, then we will be able to uh, go forward and uh, decide what to do. Okay, I'm just gonna plug this in for the other uh, annotator so that we don't lose power. Give me a second here. Let me just see whether I'm using the right microphone. Yes, okay, good. No, okay. Okay, good. All right, so let's continue. So like I said on the last slide, what we're going to say is even though we have an entire history of uh, transactions, we're just going to say that everything that you need to know to make a decision, okay, as an agent, is going to be encoded into the very last state, okay? The observation at time t contains all of the information that we need to make a decision at time t, okay? So even though, you know, there might be past things that you've done, let's say what you ate for breakfast this morning, or uh, what classes you took, or, you know, what grades you got on the last uh, quiz or something like that, uh, changes your mental state, et cetera. And certainly that history helps to understand what you're going to do. We're just going to encode all of that information in the last time segment. Okay, so uh, I think there was a bug earlier here. So this one, this one here should be a plus. Okay, so we're saying um, that basically all of the past information is now being encoded in state uh, time t and that all that we need to know to decide what's going to happen or what uh, action I'm going to take at state uh, t plus one is just conditioned on what happened right now. Okay, 
So uh, we can do this by just pushing all the information and coding it into the last state. And then uh, we can disregard the rest of history. So all of this other information that's over here, uh, I can just discard because I, I basically just encoded it into uh, the current time step, okay? So with that, uh, the history becomes irrelevant, which is very nice. You only need the last piece of information to decide what to do. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, we have done lots of experiments, uh, not with just with humans, but with animals as well. So, uh, you know, here is a case of a rat uh, being conducted in experiments a long time ago before we had uh, animal ethics, uh, where, you know, if you ring a bell or you turn on a light, uh, you might get a reward coming out of the, the socket that's uh, in front here. Okay. But um, if you, um, do a different sequence of actions, uh, the rat will get shocked, right? So for example, if you ring the bell twice, turn on the light and then ring the bell, the rat will be shocked, uh, a minor shock. So it'll learn that to try to associate this sequence of actions as, as not being good, okay? Uh, we might also say uh, if I uh, ring the bell, turn on the light, ring the bell, turn on the light, oh, some cheese gets uh, uh, coming out of the machine, maybe somewhere over here. Um, and then the rat receives uh, some reward, okay? Um, these rewards are again not, uh, sorry, these actions are not dictated by us, you know, these are actions that the rat might do. So again, it might uh, press one of the buttons to ring the bell, press another button to, to uh, turn on the light, okay? So our question is, you know, given this information that you've seen, uh, what's the likely outcome? Are, uh, is the rat going to get a shock? or is it going to uh, get cheese, you know? So I have now turned on, uh, the rats turned on the light twice, rang the bell once, uh, lit the last light bulb, and uh, what happens? Did they get a shock or did they get cheese, okay? So actually from this example, it's really hard to tell, right? There's, there's no real pattern that you can discern from this. Actually, there are multiple uh, correct patterns you could say, right? So you could say, for example, oh, look, um, there are three out of the, four things that in the last uh, three states that are similar, so I should get cheese, right? Okay, so that might be one thing that you could say. So maybe that seems to be more likely, okay? Um, but it's not the only plausibility, right? Okay. So um, when we come to this idea of uh, doing reinforcement learning, there's basically two possible uh, instances of uh, thinking about the environment. And uh, usually we think about a game environment like the game of Go or uh, something like uh, Scrabble, something like uh, Othello, okay, where we can observe the entire environment, okay? So the agent directly in, uh, sees everything so the actual state of the environment is actually the observation that you get, okay? So uh, later on, we're gonna come up with this idea of a Markov decision process that captures this very well, okay? Um, you also have partially observable environments and that's where most of the interesting research is, right? So when you're in an environment where you don't see everything that's related to uh, your rewards, okay? Um, then you are in an environment where you can only try to explore, try to ascertain um, how much uh, uncertainty there is in uh, getting rewards and your location, your state, okay? So in this case, th what the agent has in its mind and what the environment says is out there could be different, right? They're not necessarily the same thing. And so we are gonna call this a Markov decision process, but one that's uh, partially observable rather than a fully observable one, okay? Um, but it's actually the case that we can take a partially observable environment and then change it back into a fully observable environment by just encoding all the partially observed information as different pieces of information that we're gonna stick in the state information for that, okay? So we can actually um, take a, a, what we call POMDP, okay? And then transform it back into an MDP. Okay, but the interesting thing about this is this is really a learning problem, right? So uh, it's a learning problem because uh, we have this difficulty of being able to construct our own state representation. We are actually not gonna observe the entire environment and we're not gonna know exactly 
what happens when we do an action we because we can't observe everything in the environment um, so uh, you, you know we, we we don't know exactly what the utility is okay so uh, you'll see this uh, again later on when we get to recurrent neural networks um, uh, next week okay in week nine when we go to deep learning we'll see that So there are several primary components of an RL agent. Uh, basically, uh, they don't have to have all of these things, especially the model, but usually we think of actually having at least two pieces of this information. The policy is important, right? The policy, we can think of just a hash table, okay? It says, given a particular state, okay? Uh, and I'm going to index this, okay, as input, what is the action that I'm going to get out of it? Okay, so I'm going to say this is a function, takes an input state and emits an action. And because the state is, um, you know, going to be independent of all other states, you know, past history, basically, if I find myself exactly in the same state as before, okay, then I should have the same action, okay? So you can think of this as just a, a very large enumerated dictionary where I look up a state and I decide, okay, oh, it says here, when I'm in this state, I should do this. And so that's basically a recipe book for generating a policy, right? What we're going to do, okay? The other thing we need to know is for a particular state, is it a good state to be in or a bad state to be in? Because we're going to need to change what type of policy we have uh, as regards to that and uh, try to drive our agent to performing better and getting more value out of uh, doing uh, particular behaviors, okay? Whether we have a model or not depends on the algorithm that we try to engineer. So when we have an algorithm that has a model, it means that the agent basically is trying to construct a uh, representation of the environment. And once it gets a very good representation in the environment, then it can consider itself having a, a Markov decision process. Basically, this idea the, the uh, space is fully observable, okay? I know everything that's going to happen if I do a particular action, and then I can just use logical reasoning, logical deduction to decide what I should be doing, okay? All right, so uh, now we have a policy, right? The policy is basically, like I said, uh, it can be a deterministic one or where we have basically a recipe book that says if you're in this state, uh, do this action, or it could be a probabilistic one, right? That says, if you're in this state, choose one of these possible actions, but make it a, a probability distribution, okay? So I don't tell you exactly which one to do, but I, I give you some indication, maybe you should try this action versus that other one, okay? And uh, again, for the reward function, uh, we can think of it as a value, okay? So the value function Vs is basically uh, some indication of how much reward that I'm going to get at this time step, but also to evaluate how much reward I get in the subsequent time steps. Because again, when we're thinking about a particular action, we know that actions affect future environments, future decision-making. So we're not gonna condition just on the particular time point. Tone time point, okay? So we are going to say, I am going to get the reward at the next time step. Uh, I might also get the reward at the time step after that, the time step after that, okay? But I might consider that all of these are not just additive, but even though they're additive, that there is some penalty or some decay for future reward, okay? Um, and we'll talk about this in, in a while. The whole point of the value function uh, that's for a particular policy is to tell us what to do, right? So I, I'm gonna look at the expected value of having a policy, okay? And decide, that given that policy, uh, what action am I gonna take? And then uh, decide whether a policy is good or bad uh, based on the type of rewards that I'm going to get, okay? The, the value function. Okay, now with that, we can define two pieces of information that are critical for understanding a Markov decision process, okay? The first one is a transition matrix, okay? So we're gonna write that here, transition matrix. Okay, and we're just gonna use P for that, okay? It predicts the next state. It says, given that I'm in a source state S and uh, I take action A, all right? So it says over here, 
okay, then what's the probability that I'm going to end up in another state, okay, S prime, okay? And then I'm gonna encode this into a uh, probability distribution. So there are two indices, so I need to know which state I'm in, what action I took, and basically these two uh, things indicate a matrix, right? And for each cell in the matrix, I basically have a probability distribution, okay? And that fully defines what's going to happen, right? So if I'm in a uh, state right now, I'm uh, uh, at home uh, lecturing you through Zoom, uh, and I do the action, which is, you know, disconnect my uh, uh, network, then, you know, I am very likely to end up needing to restart my Zoom, for example, okay? So those are the types of information that I would encode in this probability table. Okay, so once I have this probability table, if I can get all of this information, then I know exactly what will happen. Uh, caveat the stochasticity of having a, a, a p uh, value, right, a random variable. What, what state I'm going to end, in, uh, end up in in the next state. Similarly for R, R is uh, again indexed on the same pieces of information, which is uh, a state and the action pair. Okay, uh, notice that some states may have certain actions available and some may not. Okay, so it's not always the case that all actions are available at all states. Okay, then I will try to learn what is the immediate reward for doing that. Okay, so I would know uh, after taking action A at time T, I will get a certain reward. So maybe my score goes up in the game or I actually finish doing the task and I have an immediate uh, reward. Again, in a reinforcement learning scenario, many times when we do an action, our uh, immediate reward is nothing. We don't know, you know, it's just the same as before, okay? You go left, you go right, and you just uh, keep on uh, waving back and forth between these two states. Probably nothing interesting is going to happen to your agent. Okay, so then we have this uh, grid world example, right? So we can say uh, to encourage it to get to the goal, maybe we, uh, assign a negative reward for each time you spend in the maze so that we can try to optimize the amount of electricity or time that uh, the agent's uh, spending. And we want to get to the goal, which is indicated in the bottom uh, right here, okay? So the states uh, we might say are the agent's location and the actions could be going any of the cardinal directions, okay? And after exploring the space, we might come up with a policy. This is what we want to learn, like which is the best way to get to the goal in the uh, a shortest amount of time. Of course, time is not an exact variable here, right? We're just conditioning it on the uh, amount of reward that we get at the end because our reward um, factor has a negative one for each time step that we take, then the policy is going to end up, the optimal policy is going to end up with that piece of information in line. Okay, and then the value function is basically uh, engineered from that, right? So if we get to the goal, uh, which is uh, down here, right? If we uh, come to the goal here, then we will have finished and we would have a, had a value of negative one here, right? So we can back propagate or, or propagate this information rather all the way through all the states that we have. And this would be the optimum value function that we have for this grid, okay? Now, of course, this is in the case where we have observed the entire environment, but many times when we have an RL agent, right, we plop an actual agent down here at the first step, they need to explore, right? So they're going to start and uh, they may not have the entire uh, uh, immediate reward chain, okay? But after exploring the space for a while, we might be able to see some results. So in particular, we might have visited the, the bottom left here and uh, this corridor at the top, but we may not have explored all the space. For example, I don't know that there's a conduit here because the agent never went in that direction, okay? So these updates are, are not necessarily optimal at this point because the agent is exploring, right? So um, this is why we say the agent has an internal representation if it has a model of its environment. And um, as we change our information, then we might uh, get a, a different result. For example, uh, once I find out that there's this path going uh, uh, from the top uh, uh, right corner all the way to the bottom, all of these uh, utility values or these reward values, are, uh, the state action, the state value functions are going to update, right? Because now we know that there's a shorter path in that direction. Okay, 
So as an uh, taxonomy, we can think about uh, cases where we have a value function. So we have this V function that the agent is trying to learn, okay? So just having a, a value function alone and trying to optimize the value function doesn't necessarily mean that we have a policy, right? It's basically implicit. You choose the action that's going to maximize what your estimated value is going to be at the next state, okay? So there's no explicit playbook to say, what's the next action that I'm going to take, okay? On the other hand, we can say, okay, we have a policy, just like I have you know, this playbook, I'm gonna do this, 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 this in a certain action, uh, in certain states. And I don't have this idea of what, what, what is better or not, okay? I don't have an indication whether which state is good or not. I just know what I'm supposed to do, okay? Just follow the rules, right? Okay, and there are a couple other things in the middle here. Um, and uh, so you can see here, um, that we could have a case where we uh, don't have a model, okay, meaning that we have a value function and we have a policy, but we don't have any representation of what the environment looks like, or we have ones where there is a, a model, okay, have an idea of what's going on in the world, okay? And sometimes we have the combination of all three of these things. So the actor critic is a nice algorithm uh, that's related to GANs, uh, a generative adversarial uh, methods, uh, which we're not going to learn in this course. But if you're studying RL for your project, I encourage you to look this up. It's a very interesting framework as well. OK, so um, again, we want to emphasize uh, two different things here, that there are really two different uh, problems that we are looking at in reinforcement learning. The first one is in sequential decision making of a learning type, okay? Meaning in the POMDP place uh, state, okay, partially observable Markov decision process, uh, I might have an agent that's in an environment which, uh, you know, they have amnesia, they just woke up, they don't know what's going on and they have to explore, interact with the environment to decide what types of transitions can I make uh, what's the reward for getting uh, certain uh, things done, okay? And then uh, use this information to improve how it's behaving, okay? And the other case is a planning model, right? Where we know exactly what's going to happen every time I go right or left. And that usually happens in a fully observable environment like a game, okay? So something like Go or uh, Chess are, are instances of that. Something like uh, Dota or StarCraft would be not that because uh, we, we don't have the fully observable environment. There are parts of the state space which we can't see, okay? So many times if we have a full, uh, fully specified understanding about how the world works and how we can interact with it, then we actually don't have to interact with the world at all, right? We just know how to do it. We sit down at our table and tell the agent, okay, reason about how to get to the goal. Okay, if I did this and then the environment happens this way, then I do this and the environment happens that way, then do I ultimately get to my goal? So this is an idea of planning, okay? So again, just like we talked about the difference between statistics and machine learning, statistics is many times about approximation, but learning is about learning, right? Um, we have different problems that we're trying to solve. Okay, so to make it concrete, we're gonna think about uh, this in terms of a game, right? In reinforcement learning, you may have uh, read the popular press articles about uh, open uh, 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 DeepMind uh, from Google's uh, subsidiary, learning how to play Atari games, right? And they did this without any structure and knowledge of the game. It just has information about the score, okay? That's the only piece of information that it gets. Otherwise, it just gets the pixels on the screen. It doesn't even know that there's a character. It doesn't know that uh, you can know um, that the character moves up, left, right, and down. Okay, um, so it just has uh, a controller. Okay, so the controller it can press. Okay, and then do something, and then it's going to observe some differences. Okay, so what we might want to say is, look, if you do an action and the screen changes in some way, oh. Uh, I've gotten to a new state, maybe it's good to get to a new state because maybe something else can happen from then. So I might give a slightly positive reward to uh, finding a new state where the pixels have changed, okay? So um, I just observe the pixels, I observe the uh, score, okay? So the score is actually given, it doesn't have to recognize it. And then uh, I, I need to learn how to uh, interact in order to maximize my score. 
Okay, so that's a reinforcement learning example because just like you sit down in front of a new game without an instruction booklet, you gotta learn how to play the game, okay? But uh, you can imagine this in the case of, let's say a three-year-old or two-year-old who has no idea what normal games play like, okay? This is what a reinforcement learning agent is faced with, okay? It's just doing trial and error, trying to figure out what the controllers uh, are supposed to do, okay? On the planning algorithm, it's different, right? We actually read the instruction book for the game. We know exactly what we can do, okay? And then uh, we can emulate it. We can do a thought experiment. Okay, if I were in this particular state here and I were to go to the right or I were to go to the left, I know exactly what the next state will be, okay? And I can predict whether any of the actions I did every, uh, allowed a, a particular score. And then I can plan ahead to find an optimal uh, policy, okay? So uh, if you're taking the AI course, uh, you might come across this other term, uh, tree search and minimax. There are also very good algorithms to know um, that let us uh, do game playing, uh, uh, going through this idea of alternating behaviors. Okay, with that, we're getting to the idea of a Markov decision process. So when we build up the idea of a Markov decision process, basically we have got two pieces of information that we need to study for first, okay? The first is that we need to have a random process, okay? So um, again, we can think of it as this uh, state table here, okay? Which basically has information about a source state, okay, source state here, okay? And then uh, the columns here, all of these different things tell us uh, what uh, target state we're going to end up in, okay? And obviously this means that when we sum up all of the entries in this row for a source state, they all have to sum to one, okay? You may end up uh, having a self loop saying that if you don't do any action, you end up in the same state space. But um, you know, if you take another action, you might end up in a different uh, location, okay? So this says source, sorry, my handwriting is bad. Okay, all right. So um, this is the uh, state transition probability matrix that we have here. This is just for states, by the way. We haven't introduced actions yet, so we're getting to that, okay? So when you think of a Markov chain, you just think about uh, states, transitions to, between states, and you think about um, a, a, a distribution for each row that specifies what's the likelihood of getting to a new state. Of course, that's dependent in our problem on the decisions that are being made. So we'll get to that very soon, okay? So here's an example. You know, we have uh, perhaps started at class session one, okay? And we have two actions that we could do from there. So the probability matrix specifies that there are two particular actions that I can take from this state. I might say, oh, the lecture is really boring. I covered this already. I'm going to look at Instagram. Or I might study and pay attention to the lecturer and then move on to class two, okay? So that's an example of this. Okay, so here we just have states and transitions. Okay, and so you can see what's happening here, right? When I reach a terminal state where there's nothing else I can do, for example, at the end here, sleep, um, you can see that uh, when we get to this state, there's nothing else that I can do. Then I can say that uh, my interaction has ended, okay? So I can just, um, you know, play this game, roll a, a 100 sided die, you know, a random variable to play out this, and uh, I will have observed uh, different sample episodes, right? So I can encode this entire uh, Markov chain with uh, this uh, P matrix that specifies um, uh, transition matrix between S and S, right? Both of the cardinalities of both the rows and the column are the same. Okay. After that, uh, we have the idea of states. We're going to introduce the idea of rewards, right? So with rewards, we have this extra two variables, which are a reward, okay? Which is, as I said before, uh, some idea that in a state, Exiting the state allows me to get some reward, okay? Again, this is before we have the idea of actions, okay? And then I also have this discount factor that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, which is going to say that uh, certain actions are more favored um, than others when they can get immediate reward versus future reward, okay? So this is what it looks like with rewards. The only difference here is that we've added um, a, a variable R to say when we leave this particular state, how much reward do we get for it, right? So um, the only positive one is this plus 10 here, which means we've reached our goal of passing this particular lecture's class and understanding it, 
right? Otherwise, we have to pay some penalty. Uh, another positive reward is when I take some break, I go to the club, I enjoy myself, I feel a little bit rejuvenated, and I might come back to one of the classes, right? Hopefully, we come back to class session free and we didn't lose any information. But in the case you get drunk or something like that, maybe you forgot a lot of information, then you have to go back and study from class one again. Okay, so now we've built up the whole infrastructure, we're going to introduce actions as well. Okay, so Markov decision processes basically have the idea that the agent gets to be involved, right? It just doesn't, things don't just happen to it, it gets to have some choice about what's going on in the world. So uh, that only changes two pieces of information, right? It changes how our state transitions are going to go and how the rewards are going to go, because we're going to say that the actions that the agent takes are going to influence how much reward and influence what future state it uh, ends up in. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, that is a, a difference between what we saw earlier in the Markov reward or the Markov chain uh, where we don't have this extra index on actions. Of course, they're not there at the beginning. Okay, so uh, we can take the, the similar case before and now uh, try to push it uh, on this, right? So uh, if we come back to this uh, decision process, uh, now we've upgraded it to a decision, then we can put actions on the, the edges, right? To say that we did this in order for this to happen, okay? So um, you can see here, uh, we might have the action of going to browse Instagram, browse Instagram or to study. Those are two possible out, outlets, okay? Or I might decide, uh, you know, to go clubbing at the final state or study and pass the course, okay? So um, we are going to say here, uh, for the convention, we usually don't put uh, these green nodes here that indicate which action uh, am I doing, okay? The action is associated with the front part, okay? The front part of this, okay? And then after doing an action, again, the transition probability could be that uh, a number of different things happen. So I could say, for example, attempt to study and pass the course, or I could attempt to study and then uh, fail, and then I could wind up back here. So that would be a case where the green node in the middle, this action node actually has different outcomes, again, depending on the uh, probability state transition matrix. Okay. So uh, that's the first part of it. So we'll get uh, on to the second part. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so um, let's take a look. Uh, we have a couple questions here. What does this question, uh, what, this, what does this equation mean? Okay, so um, this one, it says the action at time t is dependent on the policy, okay? So, um, what, what actions I can do are conditional on what state I'm in, right? So this is the state, right? And then uh, what policy I have, okay? What, what, what thing I'm supposed to do with that, okay? So that's what that means, okay? So um, let's try to get into that a little bit more. So if you have uh, additional questions, please just chat or put them on the poll everywhere so that we can answer them, okay? All right, how are you guys doing? Are you guys all all right? So if you are following what I'm saying, uh, could you give me some indication, a yes, or uh, in chat or on the, yeah, so that everything is uh, going all right. Paul, Hong Zen, uh, 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 Karina Bhakti, are you okay? P Kathy, Benedict, Christian, okay. All good so far, Antong, okay. So I think you guys look like you're, you, you're getting it. So uh, I'm gonna go on to the slightly harder part of what we are going to do in the post, all right? Okay, and then uh, I think that'll take a little bit longer. I'll try to pause somewhere in the middle there so I can check the poll everywhere in case uh, you're not getting it. Again, if you get to a point where you're really not sure what I'm talking about, um, let, let me try to address that right away because I don't want you to get frustrated, okay? What is the gamma used for, okay? Yes. We are going to talk exactly about uh, that for the MDP and the MRP, okay? We don't have 
this idea of um, gamma in the Markov chain, because we're not dealing with rewards, uh, so it's not there, but it is used in the MDP. It is used in the MRP, okay? So we'll see this. So this gamma is exactly our discount factor, okay? This is exactly what it is. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, in, in the post lecture, okay? Great question. So uh, let's take a look at that and then see whether we can get to the point where we're actually learning what we can do with these types of problems. Okay, so I'll come back again uh, to the poll everywhere in a, in a while. 